Okay, this is video segment 1B for unit 2. So if you haven't watched 1A yet, go back to YouTube and find 1A. That comes before this. So anyhow, I've already talked about how fossil fuels form and that they're made of mostly carbon and hydrogen. Um, ancient areas formed different types of fossil fuels. So oil primarily came from wetland areas, ocean areas, inland seas. Basically the microscopic animals like algae, <clears throat> diatoms, those kinds of things would drop to the bottom where there's very little oxygen available and then they would just pile up and concentrate the carbon and hydrogen. Natural gas actually forms above oil, um, oil sediments and can sometimes form over coal sediments in the ground as the gases seep out of the sediment. Just they're less dense so they rise above and so they're found on top of the oil and the coal. Coal primarily came from forest areas. Um, some coal can form from shallow wetlands, bogs, marshes, things like that, but primarily forests that existed millions of years ago, dropped leaves, debris, that kind of thing, laid on the ground, formed um, peat first and then through compression, concentrated the carbon hydrogen under high pressure and lots of time. Um, with fossil fuels as an energy source for us, we have to burn it in order to release that trapped potential chemical energy. So you guys learn the combustion re reaction in chemistry. Basically you have um, a hydrocarbon fuel, so C to the X, H to the Y, that X and Y just means that that's any number of those, and <clears throat> you combine that with oxygen, so oxygen is required, and it joins with the hydrogen and joins with the carbon, the oxygen do, oxygens do. Energy is released as a result. So looking at that equation, we can see that the carbon that was trapped is now released with oxygen, emitting carbon dioxide. So anytime we talk about fossil fuels being burned, whether it's coal, oil, or natural gas, we know that water, carbon dioxide, and energy are being released. The problem is, is that with this equation, it's making it look like it's totally clean, like there's no other air pollutants like sulfur dioxide or nitrogen oxide or anything like that. And that's not accurate. This, this, um, e this equation right here is actually pretty consistent with natural gas. It burns pretty clean. But coal and oil have other things mixed into it. It's a solid, so it's going to have heavy metals, it's going to have sulfur, nitrogen, it's going to have all kinds of other things in it, and so when it's burned, those things too become airborne. So that is a huge drawback to burning these fossil fuels. And I also wanted to point out that another problem is, is that it releases the CO2 which we talked about. CO2 is a greenhouse gas. I always abbreviate it as a GHG. We're going to talk more about that later, but we, I think you probably already realize that greenhouse gases are are trapping some of the heat in our atmosphere and we are in a global warming situation studies have shown that we are there and so any greenhouse gases in our atmosphere are going to add to that warming CO2 is one of them. Um, I also want to point out that fossil fuels in general as an energy source for the world provides more than 80 percent of our energy for the planet so it is heavily used and we know that it's non renewable. So eventually we will run out. Um, you have to know the, f the different types of coal. So basically the different types of coal are a result of time and compression. Forms different kinds of coal. So we start out ancient forests. Boom. There we are. You can see the trees. You can smell the mosses and smell the nature. You have ferns, mosses, trees. Huge, huge amount of biomass wrapped up in those. I put in there carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen because that is what is inside these living organisms. There's obviously a lot of other elements, but as those things die and are compressed, it, they lose some of that hydrogen and oxygen and some of the other things as well, um, but they retain the carbon. So the first step is called peat, and if you are walking through the woods, and you were shuffling your feet, you'd probably see some, you know, 
parts of leaves, little teeny twigs, and just what looks like dirt. That is peat. Okay, that's the first step to coal formation. Can you burn it? You can, but you don't get very much heat or energy from it. So thousands of years go by, more compression, more pressure, more concentration of carbon. We lose some of that, more of that hydrogen and the oxygen. And now we're looking at a rock, lignite. I'm going to pass around examples of these in class, but lignite is now a rock. So this is more like soil. This is now a rock, but it's like chalky rock. It's chalky black, and it, it makes your hands dirty if you touch it. I mean, it's very, very soft rock, but you can burn it. You just don't get as much energy from it. Um, thousands of more years go by concentrating the carbon, losing the hydrogen and the oxygen, and now it's a, it's a hard rock. It's not chalky anymore like the lignite. It's been compressed. It's called bituminous coal, and I know you're going to be embarrassed, but I want you to say it out loud <laughs> no matter where you're at. Bituminous, because everybody gets that messed up. So this coal um, can now really be used in coal plants, burning power plants. So it will put out a, a good amount of energy, um, but not as much as the next stage. So more thousands of years go by, carbon concentrates even more, and hydrogen and oxygen is lost. So we have anthracite, and I want you to say that out loud too. Anthracite, <laughs> which now we're looking at mostly carbon. It's not pure carbon because we know pure carbon is diamonds. So I can only imagine what mines you're going to find diamonds, right? Anthracite mines. But anthracite is mostly carbon. The more concentrated the carbon, the more energy that we get when we burn it. So <clears throat> we are fortunate that we have very large U.S. deposits of this. This and bituminous, both of them. And so we're pretty, one positive to coal burning power plants is that we have a lot of it. And it's on our own turf. We're not relying on other countries to um, provide us imports of this material. We, we have it. We're good. We're set. And... It provides a lot of energy when it is burned. So this this is um, bituminous. The lignite I didn't put a picture on here, but it's very it's much um, more rough looking, um, powdery looking on the outside. But this is bituminous. You can see it's a little rough. It's not going to leave your hands dirty. And then this is anthracite. So you can imagine the difference in compression and you know just the pressure that this is under and the heat to make this shiny. And that's pretty profound amount of pressure and time, thousands of years difference between these two. And very different in energy output. This one is so much more energy output than this one. This image is showing you the stages. So we have peat right here. We can see twig material and you can see, you know, leaf material and things like that, like soil. It gets compressed, which is why it's kind of shorter here, and forms lignite. Um, this is an additional step. It's called subbituminous, which you don't need to know about, but it's just additional compression, okay, and it forms these layers. And then this is the official bituminous, so continuing compression. It's, you can see it's a much smaller amount, so this amount smushed into this, you know, area is going to, so it's much more dense. <clears throat> and then anthracite is even more, okay, more time and pressure. The primary energy source for electricity, primarily electricity, in the state, nation, and world is coal. And you need to know that, okay? Coal right now, today, is providing well over half of our electricity in the world. It's hugely widespread. It's hugely used. Um, when you, when you, if you were to visit a coal, a coal power plant, you would see an area where the coal is actually being burned. So you'd see like an incinerator area, okay? Thinking about energy conversions, the coal is burned. There's water above in pipes or in a, a container above where the coal is being burned. That water absorbs that heat energy and turns to steam. This is kinetic energy now. The steam, which is kinetic energy, turns a turbine, which is placed above the water. So the turbine then turns, which is more kinetic energy. It's connected to a generator. And the generator has magnets and copper wire. And when the magnet moves in the presence of copper wire, it generates a current. 
so now we have electricity. That's how a power plant works. So you're going to see um, steam, and you will also see the emissions from the coal, the gases from the coal being burned also, coming out of a coal power plant. Um, it does require cooling water to take that steam and condense it back into liquid water, and then it's re-pumped back into the system. So you will see these located near surface water sources, like our Great Lakes, or major rivers, or major lakes, not more Great Lakes, I guess, or even the ocean. And it, so we have some input of water that's required to condense that steam back into liquid. <clears throat> um, some drawbacks to coal being used as an energy source for us, we have to mine it. And so we mine it two different ways. Strip mining where you're removing the surface, where the, the coal seam is close to the surface, so we just remove that soil and the trees and everything that lives there, which is really damaging to the ecosystem. Or we dig tunnels through down to the bottom. Both of them actually damage the ecosystem. And they're risky for human health because coal mines produce some very toxic gases too and collapsing mines and we've heard of those kinds of incidents that have taken place tragically. Um, burning coal also puts out big time air pollutants. I mean we're going to talk about, um, actually we already talked about air pollutants in the, the um, Clean Air Act. Coal is really responsible for almost all of those. Um, so I listed here socks and knocks, heavy metals like mercury and lead, and other toxins. It's just, it's a bad deal. And you can see, just to point out what this is, this is the coolant water. So that what's coming out of here is not pollutant, it's actually steam right there, okay? And then, and so are these. These are all coolant areas. But this, are these two skinnier stacks are actually what's putting out the products from the combustion of the coal itself. So that's where the NOx and SOx and CO2 and um, mercury and lead are all coming from. Pros though. So if it, coal is providing more than half of the world's electricity, there must be a pretty big pro out there. I mean, why, why would we use it so much if it's so bad? Well, it's much more abundant in the earth than oil or gas. Okay, there was vast, vast forests out there millions of years ago that existed. And so they provided us now with so much coal. I mean, the, the coal reserves, I read somewhere that those reserves are expected to last over 100 years, which sounds like a lot of time, but in reality, 100 years is really not that long in the whole big scheme of things. But whatever, we have a lot to last us. It is less expensive than oil or gas. It doesn't need much processing, although with the clean coal methods that we have, we do process some of that coal. But oil and gas um, require some processing. The transportation of, of coal is pretty easy with trucks and trains. We don't require a pipeline to transport the coal like we do with oil. The infrastructure, the power plants, the technology that we have in those power plants already is understood, known, and in place. So that's a huge benefit. We can whip up a coal power plant like nothing. <clears throat> and you guys, that is it. So hopefully um, you got down all the notes, and if you have any questions, be ready to ask those in class tomorrow.